Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. I'm the director of the CSFI and my co-director Jane Fuller and I have a full panel today to discuss green finance education skills and uh, education in the green finance area. What do we need given uh, the growth of the financial services sector, given the importance of uh, a green approach to uh, finance most most broadly and indeed economic development more generally. I'm delighted that we have a very distinguished panel. We have Simon Thompson, who is the CEO of the Chartered Banker Institute, which I'm sure you know is uh, sort of half Scottish and half United Kingdom these days. Uh, he's been the CEO there for 14 years. He helped set up the CBI's professional, uh, the Chartered Banker Institute's professional uh, standards board. He was formerly with the International Accounting Education Standards Board, and before that with ACCA, so he knows his onions. Uh, after, um, In addition to that, we have Simon Connell, who is the Global Head of Sustainability Strategy at Standard Chartered. He'd be, he's been at Standard Chartered for eight years. Also, chairs the uh, Banking Environment Initiative at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. Sarah Ivory, who is the uh, lecturer in climate change and business strategy at the University of Edinburgh's Business School and also director of the Centre for Business Climate Change and Sustainability. Um, she is a former chair of the British Academy of Management, Sustainable and Responsible Business special interest group, and I've said all that right. And then Will Goodhart, and many of you will know Will, he's the CEO of the CFA Society for the UK, of the UK. He has been for 15 years a board member of the Impact Investing Institute. Previously, I was astonished to learn at Euromoney, he was uh, where he was the managing editor. That really is a poacher turned gamekeeper. Um, your money being in that sort of red in tooth and claw journalism. Uh, what I'm going to do, and my colleague Jane Fuller, uh, as I say, will will come in with with questions and points as and when required. But what I'm going to do is to ask Simon Connell, uh, as as it were, a representative of the entire financial services sector, to tell us what do we need, what does the sector itself need in terms of uh, education in the green finance area. Um, Take that as broadly as you can and answer as broadly as you can. Simon, Simon Connell. Thank you, Andrew. And I shall, I shall answer from the perspective of one UK financial institution and, and hope that it's reflective of others. So as I'd reflect on where we are in the landscape, um, at Standard Chartered, I would estimate we have increased by tenfold the number of staff working directly on sustainability matters in the past five years. And I think that will continue to increase in the coming years. And so there's a significant increase in demand for skills and education. But as we increase the number of staff working in this area, I think they become uh, representative of a broad range of needs as well. So we're starting to see those at the early stages of the career preferencing on working in the various different facets, whether it's in structuring sustainable finance products on the retail side or on the corporate side, whether it's managing climate risks, whether it's helping guide and define the strategy and the stakeholder engagement. We're seeing those mid-career professionals want to understand and upskill themselves and potentially either move into dedicated sustainable finance roles or to be able to bring that aspect into their existing roles. And then those, again, further through their career. And so what I think we're seeing is a broadening of the categories of training need. So I think it's difficult to homogenize and to think of those as, as one set of needs. But if I do step back and try to do that, to my mind, what we're trying to do is give everyone a baseline knowledge of what is sustainability, what is sustainable development, thinking to reference frameworks like the UN Sustainable Development Goals, so that everyone is starting from the same basis, but then taking that out into those various different role types, into those various different specialisms and thinking about how far that needs to extend. So if we're talking about relationship managers, they have one type of skill set. Um, we've just finished some work with, with a peer group of banks with the University of Cambridge uh, on how to engage clients on climate. And again, recognizing that a lot of that work has initially been done within the, the risk function of the organization with people who are specialized in, in the concept of various climate models and scenarios. But now the hard yards uh, are being felt by the frontline population who need to take that analysis out and engage with their clients. And that's a different skill set, but still needs to be framed on a basic understanding of some of those. Um, 
So what is the what's the existing skill set of the individual? What's the role? How do they adapt that to the to their needs? And then how do you situate that within the wider organizational need? So yes, to my mind, it's it's that story of growth in demand being met by growth in 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 supply of training, matching the supply to the needs of the organization and to the individuals within that organization, and reflecting as we do so that that is quite a a broad set. You might have dedicated roles, and I think that to think forward, uh, I'm I, I, I'm reminded I've I've been working in in the sustainability and financial services space for about 15 years, and and ev- every so often someone comes along and sort of tells the story about doing ourselves out of roles because at some point in the future, you know, unspecified date in the future, and um, we won't need this type of work because it will be everybody's business. I'm still never quite sure when the event horizon for that is going to be or whether we'll reach that. Um, but I do think that there is a point to be made on that around the fact that at the moment we're continuing to upskill and build specialist roles on sustainability and the types of training and education that need to come with those. But in time, it will become everyone's business. And so there's a question for an organization like Standard Charter with over 80,000 people across Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. How do you give everyone that baseline knowledge? And how do you recognize that point at which everyone has a little bit of sustainability in their role, even if there's also a population who have a lot and for whom it is the dedicated focus of their role? And again, how do you think about tailoring your training and your capacity building propositions to those two different use cases, those who need to know a little across a broad role and those who need to know a lot across a more refined role? Jane, well, can you just talk a little bit about how you see the demand for uh, green education, green trained people in the in the financial industry? I mean, one thing that intrigues me, um, about what Simon was saying, is um, is this? I mean, I'm glad he said the 15 years actually. So, he obviously, takes goes back to before the financial crisis. So, in what sense is this um, different? In a, to, you know, in terms of uh, to a degree, from, say, retraining staff in the wake of the financial crisis, you know, whether that was on capital, risk-taking, um, or ongoing training in terms of reputation, or indeed ongoing, you know, continued professional development in terms of risk management. So is there, is there something that's some um, really different but in kind and in the sort of quantum of the demand here compared with the sort of waves of training and retraining that's had that have had to go on, whether it's been prompted by crises or whatever. Simon Connell. Thank you. I think it's an excellent question. And again, it's where I came to, to that concept of needing to ensure that any training is grounded on the concept of sustainable development, because it is somewhat different. I, I think I worry indeed that sometimes we we silo things too much. We think about climate risk, for example, as a specific domain, and we train people on that, and then and then we forget about the other areas of sustainable development. But the reason I do think it's different is, in some ways, that post global financial crisis wave of training was about giving people additional skill sets to build on to their roles. But if we're thinking about sustainable development, we are thinking about that rewiring of the economy. We're thinking about how do we actually create structures within which we can continue economic activity within the planetary boundaries. And so I think that's that's where it is a little different. It's it's giving people a very different conceptual framework within which to work and then within which to think about, okay, as a bank and as asset manager, as an insurer, how am I working with capital to support, as I say, working within the planetary boundaries? So a, a big step change in terms of the training required. Um, Simon, Simon Thompson, how how do you see it? You have a, a very a synoptic view of the uh, education and training system, uh, not just not just obviously through the Chartered Banker Institute, but more broadly. Uh, well, it is it is a big uh, systemic change. I mean, let's let's remember this is to um, support the uh, you know the the biggest uh, economic change and upheaval um, since the Industrial Revolution. Um, and uh, although we're talking about it in the terms of um, green and sustainable finance skills. I think many of the things we'll talk about will apply right across every economic entity and every economic activity as well. Um, and if we think about education, um, I like to think of this in terms of the, the exam question then that Mark Carney has set us, which is how do we ensure that every professional financial decision includes climate change? Although, like Simon, I, I would sort of broaden that out to think about a broader range of sustainability factors uh, too. I think what we we need is a is a 
is a much more ambitious vision for the upskilling and reskilling of banking and finance professions that is a, as ambitious as the objectives of the COP26 private finance strategy or the, the recent Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, where, yes, every professional decision includes climate change, but where every finance professional develops an understanding of and is able to apply the principles and practice of sustainability in the context of their role, their function and their organisation. Um, and that won't, uh, Simon, you're glad to hear, do you out of a job because we will still need an increasing number of, of senior experienced expert uh, sustainability leaders right across banking and finance. But I would absolutely agree with your point that everybody will need a, a bit of it in their role. And this is partly about uh, supporting our alignment with Paris and the SDGs. Uh, but I think there's two other important aspects to it as well that we might want to go on to think about. You know, firstly, and in, uh, in, in terms of the UK, it's about building the, the capability and capacity of green finance centres such as the City of London. And this is becoming a very competitive area. It's not so much a, a war for talent as a war for, for skills now. Um, and uh, last week, I think we saw the release of the most recent Global Green Finance Centres Index, so Amsterdam and Zurich are ahead of London, and Singapore, Beijing and other places are catching up fast, um, driven in large part by, by their investment in skills. And then secondly, I think professional education and training is, is one of the best defences we have against greenwashing. Um, and if every finance professional develops an understanding of and is able to apply the principles and practices of sustainability in the context of, of, of their role and, and where they work, they're much more likely to be able to at least ask the right questions or approach opportunities and risks with an appropriate degree of professional scepticism uh, that will uh, help um, avoid perhaps some of the recent stories we've seen about banks, bankers, investment managers, financing fossil fuels, deforestation or, or palm oil, to give just a couple of examples that have been in the papers recently. Can I ask you, Simon, just to, to pick up on that? I mean, uh, one of the, sorry, Simon Connell, to pick up on Simon Thomas's point there about London, London's position as a uh, green finance centre being under threat uh, with, I think, did you say Singapore and Amsterdam now ahead, uh, which struck me, I must say, as, as a bit of a surprise. Is the, uh, is, in your opinion, the, the, the supply of talent in London drying up relative to the supply of talent in other centres? Um, I think it's, it's interesting, based in, in about 60 markets across Asia, Africa and the Middle East, we've always found there's, there's a reasonably deep pool of talent in London um, compared to some of the other markets. I think that will persist. Um, but I would also just reflect back to, to the start of this conversation, which is we need to nurture and develop that pool of talent. And, and that talent is changing. Again, 10, 15 years ago, there, were, there was a small number of people who had that combination of banking skills and sustainability skills and could bring them together. And, and that's, I think, the purpose of the growing number of quite in-depth courses being offered by UK and other academic institutions it is to create people, uh, ready-mades, as it were, with that skill set or to build on one or the other. So to build on those coming with the sustainability knowledge and to build out their financial knowledge or, or more often the other way around, to build on those who have the financial knowledge, the mid-career professionals, and give them the sustainability understanding. So I think London is in a good place. Um, we, we also have a number of world-renowned academic institutions who have been working on this for some time, but it does need to continue to, to, to be consciously developed. Of course, when we say London, we mean London Edinburgh. Um, oh, sorry. The whole of the UK, I should say, especially in this context in which many of us are working from from front rooms and bedrooms across the UK. Will, what's what's your your take on on all of this? I mean, you're you're the UK, UK end of a global uh, financial education um, institution that is, shall we say, one of the most rigorous in the world, I guess. So, thank you. No, that's very kind. And um, yeah. <laughs> It, it's um, somewhat boring of me to say so, but I agree with a great deal of what's already been said. Um, in terms of, of sort of London as a, or the UK as a sort of financial centre and a leading centre for sustainable finance and sustainable investment. Um, and again, I can really only talk to sustainable investment because that's really the, the, the field that we're involved in. Um, I think that the UK does have a, a leading position. It's one of the reasons that um, we were able to develop 
our certificate in ESG investing here because there's a great body of expertise. Many of those experts come from all across the world and have a global perspective. And the UK has always had a, a global perspective because our domestic market is really too small to support a, a sort of the, the financial services centre that, we, that we've got. So we're very good at bringing the world's talent into the UK and hopefully that will um, persist um, in future. Um, and drawing on that, uh, we and other professional bodies have been able, I think, to put together programs um, to meet the demand that Simon Connell was talking about earlier. And I think one of the things that the professional bodies can do, and we have done, is to provide that foundational level of knowledge. Um, yeah, we can define what it is that somebody needs to know, which actually can be quite helpful because there's such a torrent of information on sustainability coming at people at the moment. Yeah, that you could read blogs on sustainability all day long. Um, and you know, occasionally I do, uh, and it's great fun. Just make sure that I'm sort of, yeah, we're on top of what's happening. But actually you need to sometimes put a frame around it and say, you know, that's a nice to know, it's not a need to know. The stuff you really need to know and that you need to then keep your knowledge, um, uh, 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 you know, keep abreast of changes in that field. Uh, having a group of individuals from the sector being working on that caring for the syllabus and then amending the qualification and the exams as we go forward means that the individual doesn't have to worry about that. They can say, okay, well, I've been told what I need to know. I'll go away. I'll read the book. I'll, now I know what I need to know. You don't become expert. You know, you only become expert by either attending something like a sort of a master's course or even more likely doing a master's, but also having years of experience like Simon. But actually getting that foundational knowledge out into the market is critically important because it means that people have that base technical competence and ethical competence that Simon Thompson was referencing, you know, that they can ask the right question, they can hold people to account. They may not do it as well as the specialist in a team, but they can bring something to the attention of a specialist in a team because they can know it just doesn't look quite right. So, you know, it's I suppose all education is good. Any incremental education is better. Um, and what we're seeing at the moment is um, a great deal of demand um, for education around sustainability. And I sort of, I suppose I refer to saying sustainability um, purposefully. I think it is a little bit broader than, than green. I think the emphasis should be on the environmental issues. Um, because there is a, a much shorter time horizon for the resolution of those than there is for some of the social issues. But the social issues are very much bound up in that. Um, and at the Impact Investing Institute, we've done a lot of work to think about how can we help the market understand impact investing um, and how impact differs um, or is at one end of the spectrum um, of sustainable investing. Um, but I suppose that those would be my, my opening remarks. Can I ask Jane to think a little bit aloud about the, the professional bodies? Because the Chartered Banker Institute is, is, is one of the leading ones that CFA Institute, you yourself are a member of and you've been involved with. Where, where, where do they fit in, in, in both creating the demand, but also satisfying the demand? Oh, well, I, I think that the answer to that's relatively mm -hmm. simple, that I think it's very important that the leading, you know, recognised um, professional training bodies uh, are heavily involved in this. I mean, um, they, they have been running CPD programmes, they have been adapting their syllabus, um, and I think it's much more credible, the idea that, that, that the Chartered Banker Institute and CFA UK, probably CISI, whatever, are offering, are developing courses to tackle this, rather than having sort of new educational bodies sort of popping up you know, um, without that sort of pedigree. So I think that's, it's very much, I'm, I'm glad that the mainstream training organisations are in, in, taking a lead on this. Um, I mean, that, one of the reasons for that is, and I'm, I was pleased to hear um, Simon Thompson say it should be an antidote to greenwashing, is that um, you need to make sure there's some rigour in all this. Uh, I mean, having trained journalists, it's very, it's very easy when there's a subject like this that's rather sexy for people to get... Who, sort of um, too carried away with um, whatever, saving the planet, you know, some of the political issues, some of the ethical issues, um, and not really to know how to do the, the, you still have to do some sums. So in a very, you know, CFA model would be if you're doing a discounted cash flow forecast, 
you know, you obviously have to factor in to an oil company what's going to, you know, how will the changing demand for and regulation of the oil market af- affect prices and cash flows in the future? And you've also got to factor it into the discount rates. You know, are these companies more risky? And therefore, you, you know, you apply a bigger discount rate. So there's actually, um, I think that these bodies are best placed to make sure that the training um, builds on the sort of more, you know, rigorous platforms that they've had in place for decades. And I uh, let's bring in uh, Sarah, Sarah Ivory here. I mean, I assume that you most of your most of your students are undergraduates, but you'll also have a significant graduate postgraduate program as well. I mean, but either way, they are in a way the raw material who goes into the industry rather than the mid career people who are being trained by the CFA Institute or the Chartered Banker Institute. Would that be fair? And and what what do you see as their professional? Uh, progression after they leave the University of Edinburgh's business school? Well, we have a large undergraduate program, but actually um, the bigger part of our training would be in postgraduates. So um, we uh, at Edinburgh have had an MSc in climate change finance and investment for almost a decade now, uh, similar to the one in Imperial. Those are the two UK-based MSc programs that train most of the people in this space. Uh, And then in addition to that, we do a lot of executive education and more and more every day, uh, you know, every day we get calls for it. Um, So our undergraduates of the professional institutes. um, Well, ours is often different because as exactly what Will said, professional institutes provide a lot of foundational knowledge, um, cut through a lot of the the incredible data uh, and information, the overwhelming information that's out there. Um, but what we can often do often do is offer bespoke programs into specific uh, organisations. Uh, and, and as Simon Connell mentioned, uh, for example, for one of the major UK banks, we've done a program for a thousand of their colleagues and it had to do a lot of things. It had to hit the people who were doing finance. So it had to have elements of finance, but it also had to hit relationship managers who didn't have that finance background, certainly weren't at CFAs, certainly weren't, weren't with the CBI either but needed to be able to have intelligent climate change conversations um, with enough finance sprinkled in, enough climate change sprinkled in, but actually focus more on their clients. Uh, So actually our our kind of areas cover those sorts of things. But I think when we think about this, I, I I don't like to call it training because I think training suggests it's like training in an Excel spreadsheet or, you know, training in how to do an NPV. And this is completely different. This is about conversations about really complex areas that no one on this screen or anywhere has all the answers to. Uh, And I think it's about almost like a co-creation of the way forwards. And so when I talk to a lot of uh, clients and potential clients, we talk about you've got to look inward to your own organisation, you've got to look outward to your industry, and you've got to look forward to the future. Um, And there's a lot of prediction in all of those areas, Um, a lot of assumptions that you'll need to make when you're starting to think about, A, what will the world look like? And B, what are your staff going to need? Because we don't, you know, we're going to, we're training undergraduates now for roles that don't even exist yet for when they're going to be in their mid-careers. I mean, that's fascinating. Andrew, can I pick up on Sarah? I thought Sarah's made, well, made, made lots of great points, but but I wanted to pick up on Sarah's point around, um, you know, the, the, uh, the sort of how we approach education in this area and, and that kind of conversation. And I think it's incredibly important for, for one reason, because you know, green finance in particular, as we now are coming to understand, isn't a matter of, of black and white, but to use Mark Carney's phrase, it's 50 shades of green or many more. And, you know, as I know that, you know, people such as Ben Caldercott of this, this parish and others uh, would, would say, just to take the example of the EU taxonomy of trying to divide the world into green and brown, that's not really the answer. Um, you know, banks and businesses need to look at the, the credibility of, of transition plans and how those can be financed and how they're aligned with, with Paris and so on. And, and this isn't easy, but what it requires is both expertise and the exercise of professional judgment. And this is one of the things that really gets me excited about why we as the Chartered Banker Institute and other professional bodies are so active in this area. It's not just because sustainability uh, is such a a, a critical part of the future of our our planet. It's a critical part for the future of our profession. Um, And uh, uh, it's a great reason for continuing to invest in having human beings doing banking rather than simply machines. Because whether it's that sort of... uh, 
uh, brown versus green trade-off, whether it's some of the trade-offs when we look at sustainability more broadly between environmental sustainability and social sustainability, you know, the concept of the just transition and so on. Again, it requires expertise and judgment to balance competing objectives and to meet sort of short, medium and long-term societal goals, financing needs and, and, and so on. It's very complicated, but that's what makes it very exciting too. Simon, can I just jump in there for, with, with a couple of reflections? So the first, um, I'm going to challenge you slightly because I think on the taxonomy, it, it's it's not so much whether it's the answer, it's what the question was that was being answered. Um, I, I, but just to pick up on that and the complexity point, I mean, we I, earlier in our sustainability journey, we created what we called our sustainability philosophy, which was partly, it was intended initially as a tool, a diagnostic that we're working with with the board, and it became an external document because it tries to acknowledge that it, we are trading things off. A, in terms of we, you know, if you solve one part of the sustainability puzzle, you, you might create harm elsewhere, or you, you, you might have some issues elsewhere that you need to be mindful of. Um, uh, and, and again, the siloing point. And so I, I think, and I'd just like to echo a point made by a couple of others on, on the panel, including I think by Sarah and by Jane, there's a bit of a Dunning-Kruger effect here. I'm sure we've all seen uh, online bios or, or LinkedIn profiles of people where they say, you know, they spent 10 years doing something else and then they did a short course on sustainability and now they're, they're experts in ESG. Uh, I mean, let's not get to that ESG phrase. It's, it's, it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine, but that point that it takes some time to understand what you don't know as much as what you do know. Um, and and my, perhaps my last comment there is the IIF and Deloitte put out a great report earlier this year, I believe, um, on the role of the chief sustainability officer called the sense maker in chief. And I think it speaks to a lot of what we're speaking about here. I mean, at two levels, one is, again, this point we're making through the course of this conversation that there is not one homogenous need for training and, and knowledge it depends on who the individual is and what their context and their objectives are. But the other is, yes, there is a lot out there. And whether to avoid the Dunning-Kruger effect at the sort of very, as it were, entry level of the pyramid or at the very top to try and help us uh, sort of give people diagnostic tools, it is about that refinement of, okay, what are these competing concepts that I'm dealing with and how do I think about making them specific to my organization and putting some sort of hierarchy of action around them? Can you just explain a little bit more about the sense maker in chief role? I mean, that's uh, that's... Particularly interesting, I guess. Sure, and I, I, I'm probably taking too much credit for say all the work that Deloitte and IIF did here on, on this one, but I think it's you know, and it's a great report. I'd commend it to anybody who's, who's got a little bit of time to go away and at least read the executive summary. As, as Will said, we could spend all day reading these things, but that is one I think is worth reading. But it's this concept that again, you you know, you're dealing in both pre-existing systems within financial institutions, the way in which they're working. You're dealing with a very fast moving and noisy external environment. You're thinking about the context of an organization. And again, which of these dimensions can or should it take action on? And the need to have a, a skill set that would enable you to sequence those. And again, identify which are the most tractable problems for an organization. But again, beneath all of that is an ability to be able to look at these problems and actually contextualize them and think, okay, what is this sustainability landscape that I'm operating in? And I think that's particularly important because even at, at that top of house, if we look across the, the biographies of, of the kind of this emergent crop of chief sustainability officers or their equivalent, it's not to be presupposed that they're all coming from a sustainability background. Often they are people who have had success in enabling change within their organizations on other thematics. And so as much as anyone else, they're in need of that support and that capacity building to be able to take the transferable skills they've got, but add to it a new skill set to enable them to be that, as I say, sense maker in chief, that, that individual helping to guide their organization in, in working out which problems are theirs to solve and how they go about solving them. Can I ask you one more question? Uh, um, just break down that we have representatives of two leading professional bodies and one leading academic body. How do you see the academic bodies and the professional bodies providing the supply of talent and where do they fit into the, the general mix? So I feel like I'm probably repeating some of the great concepts that others have, have brought forward here. But to me, it's quite simple. I mean, I'm, I was lucky enough, I'm a, a chartered management accountant and, and also a corporate treasurer. And, and again, through both of those professional bodies, they gave me the grounding for those uh, various parts of my career. And even back then, as it were, I started to see sustainability come in. So I think if we recognize the role of those professional bodies, it's to link sustainability into the core curriculum and the roles that they're preparing their, their, their students for, 
and then again, I think that those who want to elevate it, those who want to move from it being a portion of their role to being a substantial portion of their role, would then have call on Sarah and others to try and take that knowledge further, to say, okay, this is somewhere that I want to invest in myself and I want to build some knowledge in pursuit of a role uh, or even I've got a role, help, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm self-acknowledging suffering from the Dunning-Kruger effect here. Um, how can someone help me here? And so that's where that, again, it's, it's that dual role. The bodies are there to help give everyone the baseline knowledge as they come through with a specific skill set, you know, whether it's accounting, um, whether, whether it's as a chartered banker, and then the universities are there to help build upon that where people want to take that further. For it to be a focus. I have it the other way around in some ways, but then I'm te I tend to be thinking about undergraduate education. And of course, it's quite clear that the uh, University of Edinburgh Business School, and indeed Imperial, is looking primarily at early career um, people who've taken a, a couple of years off. Jane, do you have a thought on that, where the professional bodies and the universities fit together? Robert, um, I'd like to hear from Sarah on that. Um, actually, uh, Sarah, actually, would you like, just like to comment on that first? Because actually, I was, I was going to make a slightly different point. Yeah, sure. So a couple of things. First of all, um, we've got a real mix of people in our program, and I think Imperial are similar. Um, we do have some early career people. We, in fact, we have some people straight out of undergrad. You have to have gone pretty well to get into our program straight out of undergrad, but we have a few. But mostly they're mid-career, and in fact, some later career people who actually have decided they want to pivot their career into a way that makes an impact and a difference. We actually haven't talked about that much yet about that issue of the impact of the financial services on climate change. So what is the actual responsibility there, not just what is the opportunity, uh, which probably deserves a bit of a discussion. Uh, mostly we find that people are mid-ish career um, and see this as a real way of elevating their career, uh, as well as um, making a difference, you know, caring about the world uh, and, and trying to find a way to make financial services a contributor to that. And I'm sure Simon's nodding. That's why probably why he's worked in this area for a long time. Um, but I also wanted to just come in and talk about the important part of research and thought leadership. So this is not an area where we have all the answers. Nobody does. Uh, and the world is changing so rapidly. Trying to even keep up on the with the reports that are coming out about what is happening is almost impossible. And a lot of research needs to happen in what's happening and how is it happening and whether it's being effective or not. Um, Jane talked earlier about the rigour of um, a lot of the uh, uh, professional bodies, and there's also that issue of rigour of research uh, and trust in research. And I think often academic institutions have that level of trust in research. And so what we're training people on today is not what we'll be training them on in three years, but we need to do the research to lead into that training, to work out what are we recommending in three years' time, because what are people who are leading in the area right now um, the, the leading banks, the leading institutions, what are they doing and did it work? And if, if we get research to show it did, then we can train people on that. So I think we have to not divorce it from the idea of research and understanding what content we should actually be teaching. Can I ask Will, Will and uh, Simon Thompson on the issue of research? Will, the CFA Institute does a lot. Yeah, we do a lot of research um, and we do that quite often in cooperation with um, academic organisations, with other universities. Um, so we have a future of sustainability and investment management report that we published at the end of last year. Um, and we had academic sort of, so obviously other academic research referenced in that. And uh, we also work with academics on that. And we have another report coming out in the future of work, which is a sort of slightly different, different topic. But again, we have a link. But I do think there is a natural link between the professional bodies in academia and that shows up actually in terms of you know academic advisors to the professional mm -hmm. bodies and and the authors you know we have quite a number of chapters across our certificates you know, certificate in the esg sorry simon and you know certificate in climate and investing you know both have um, chapters that have been authored by um you know academic faculty members um at, at leading universities and and we have ad, ad, advisors from those universities but the yeah, the professional bodies can operate at sort of a slightly different sort of scale so you know we can be maybe less intensive in terms of cost and time and therefore slightly more accessible to a large organization to put large numbers of people through whereas and you know a, a, a large bank or a large investment manager is probably going to select 
people that you know that it already has in sort of senior decision making managerial roles or in sort of specialist roles advisory roles to then work with the universities and gain that additional specialist knowledge that's going to be slightly more costly in terms of both time and money um, but the investment is then worth it so it's a sort mm-hmm. of a slightly different objectives that i think you know the, the the financial services sector has for working with professional bodies and working with with academia but there is very clearly um, yeah, a link between the, the two as well. Sam Thompson, you are. Oh, yes, just to, to build on, on Will's point, I mean, that collaboration between uh, the academic world and the professional body world is something that I've been really pleased to see has really grown and continues to grow over the over the past 10 or 15 years. I mean, in, in our own case, we we work very closely with a number of Sarah's colleagues at Edinburgh. A couple are, are helping with, with one of the new sustainability programmes we're putting together at the moment, for instance. And uh, and we're signposting our members towards um, towards some of the executive education programs on climate change and sustainability at Edinburgh, um, and also indeed at the Smith School at Oxford and CISL and uh, and elsewhere, because it's something you know we could do ourselves, but actually um, Edinburgh and Cambridge and Oxford and places can do them so much better than we can. So you know why should we try and try and duplicate? Um, I think. You know, I'm glad Will sort of brought up the concept of collaboration as well, because the other big change I've seen in the education space or the professional education space over the past decade or more is the much greater collaboration between professional bodies as as well. Um, and uh, and one thing I did want to talk about this afternoon was the the Green Finance Education Charter, which uh, was announced by the the UK government in its 2019 Green Finance Strategy. And was launched uh, almost uh, a year ago now and is a, a world first designed to help build the capacity and capability of the UK's green finance sector by bringing together 12 of the world's leading UK based chartered and professional bodies um, who just on a UK uh, uh, context um, uh, have sort of more than a million members so these are accountants, bankers, treasurers, investment managers, financial analysts, insurers, risk managers, many other professionals who are fundamental to the definition and integration of professional and technical standards in both UK and global financial markets, and that includes sustainability. Um, And so we're all working together to try and build the UK's international competitiveness and position as a a global centre for green finance and build that capability and capacity we, we need. Um, and uh, I know, you know, obviously there, there are similar collaborations in the academic world as as well. Um, and uh, while we all compete around the margins, um, you know, ultimately we are competing um, uh, in terms of the UK in a global market, but we're also com- competing against time to try and decarbonize by 2050. And if we don't work together um, on education and skills and all of the other areas, we sure as hell won't manage it. Um, so I think that is absolutely the, the, the critical critical word here, collaboration between professional bodies, between professional bodies and academia, um, and, uh, and in the wider world as, as, as a whole. Jane, you had something. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about, I think this um, research you know, it is really important. I mean, I'm looking forward to reading articles in the Financial Analyst Journal. Uh, testing the theory that you can, which is now seems to be current, that you can always do well by doing good. Um, we just don't know to what extent to, over the past decade or two it's been a coincidence, um, you know, due to the rise of tech stocks, which um, in terms of E, although their S and G is rather more question, questionable, but in terms of E are obviously less polluting than oil, gas, old industry. Um, we don't, so we don't know if that's a coincidence or and to what extent there can be some sort of, you know, causality that if you invest um, in these renewable um you know, more future-proofed uh, type of enterprises you're going to do better? Uh, or is it actually a reflection of the G? It's like the diversity debate. You know, it's not not so much, um, it shows that you have a forward-looking management that's actually properly assessing risk, where you can imagine a proper sort of challenging discussion amongst board members about pros and cons and things, particularly on sort of the sensitive trade-offs. You know, so is, is, is it a way of identifying that? So, you know, I, I'm looking forward to what the research really will tell us um, about. Um, well, that, that's, they... that's a, a good segue. To, I mean, let's, it's, Sarah ought to uh, ought to be able to to respond to that. What kind of research is on the stocks at the moment? Does it answer the questions that Jane raises? 
Uh, there is research into that area. That's not my area, and I would uh, hesitate to uh, step on the toes of my colleagues. I think the key issue for me is around uh, taking a step back and asking the question of purpose. Um, and it's actually something we haven't talked about here of, of what's the purpose of the financial services industry and what's the purposes of the professional bodies. Um, and actually, you know, Simon and I think Will also made a really interesting point about being leaders um, and being kind of leaders in this area and showing um, what what should what topics should be in core education because they matter. Um, and you know, I'm often trying to get people to stop thinking about the what, which is hard anyway, uh, and the and the how, which is harder, but you know, we're still working on it. And think about the why. So why are we doing it? Why is green finance becoming big? And how will it become bigger? So I certainly haven't answered your question there, Jane. Um, but I think that I would say that um, uh, non-green investment will certainly may give you returns in the short, short term, but it, it, it's certainly going to cause incredibly difficult problems for uh, our future generations. Simon, Simon Thompson, can you you raise the uh, the the the, uh, the green education charter? I mean. Just, just, I think perhaps you should just say a little bit more about exactly what it is and who, who, how it is going to impact the educational system in this country. Is that? Um, certainly, yeah. So, so it involves twelve of uh, twelve global professional bodies based based in the UK. Uh, so you've got the uh, all the main uh, chartered accounting bodies. Uh, you've got my own body, CISI, you've got the Chartered Insurance Institute, you've got the CFA Society of the UK, uh, Will's, Will's body, we've got the, the corporate treasurers, uh, we've got the London Institute of Banking and Finance, um, and, uh, and a couple more too. So as I mentioned earlier, sort of more than a million uh, members and students across the financial services sector are, are encompassed by, by, the professional, by the professional bodies. Um, and sort of what we've what we've what we've done so far, um, what we're, is to um, we've done some of the we've done some of the easy bits. We've we're, we're all engaging with our with our members and with our partners and the general public to raise awareness of climate change, environmental, and other sustainability issues. We're all working on developing a range of green and sustainable finance education resources. So um, Will mentioned the CFA's uh, certificate in ESG investing. We have our own certificate in green and sustainable finance. Uh, many of the accounting bodies have programs in this space as, as well. Um, we're encouraging the adoption and harmonization of relevant global and national standards and frameworks, whether that's things like the TCFD, you know, the accounting bodies in particular are doing a lot of work behind the scenes on the sustainability standards and uh, uh, all the good work that's going on with the IFRS Foundation. And um, perhaps most notably, um, our perhaps biggest achievement in the first year is to we've launched an open source green finance education toolkit hosted by our colleagues at the Green Finance Institute, which provides freely accessible resources for educators, regulators, and others who want to develop their own country's capacity and capability, especially in the developing world. And the idea really is that as a global first, the, you know, the charter is fantastic for us in the UK and for the professional bodies to collaborate together. But really what we want to do is to use this as a model for other countries to develop similar initiatives in an effort to build a harmonized global approach to the skills and training necessary to ensure that green finance becomes mainstream finance. And so we're, we're working with the Green Finance Institute and with the UK government to include this as part of the UK's climate diplomacy efforts um, in the G7 in June, and of course, particularly when we get to COP26 in November. So part of this is also about demonstrating the um, uh, you know, the UK's global lead in education and skills in this area and more broadly. And of course, one thing we haven't discussed, it's slightly beyond the topic for today, but of course, education and training, whether that's um, uh, universities, whether professional bodies, whether it's it's schools, are a huge export area for, for the UK um, and, and provides with a great global soft power. And so this is an important area that we shouldn't ignore, I think. Will, do you have anything to add to that on the uh, on the charter? No, I mean I think the charter is a great development. I think it's very good to be collaborating with the other professional bodies um, on a topic as important as this. You know, there will be some ways that we can all save time um, by learning from each other, so we're not reinventing wheels. Um, and if we can export that model to other countries, um, 
I think that would be you know a, a really um, positive step you know for the, for the UK and just to Simon's point I mean um, you know the we have a great many CFA program registrants in the UK every year um, and a very significant proportion of those um, are overseas studying at universities like Edinburgh um, and many others um, and picking up sort of CFA level one at the same time as completing a master's so it is really a very significant export for for the UK and uh, I think the the um, the the government not now very recent but sort of supportive action to enable um, you know the the, uh, the those that are involved in those programs to actually stay in the UK for a period of time after they've completed their studies was very important and very welcome. And do you feel as as somebody who, as it were, you know, is the person who has to go out and hire these people that the training is working, uh, Simon Simon Connell? I think so. I, I I think again, I, I I would reflect on the diversity of the number of training programs available um, and the need to select wisely. Um, one of the things that's not necessarily been picked up, but I do think is very helpful both for the professional bodies and also for the universities is the network effect. Um, it's certainly something that we see through the University of Cambridge Centre for Sustainable Finance and, and the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership is, is the ability to have that cohort, especially as people who are coming, they're learning and they're building a group of peers who are going to go you know, in a similar journey through their careers um, is that support network. And that helps on, on both sides as it were, it helps in having the network to engage with as you're developing, but it also helps um, in terms of having the network to, to, to sort of be a, a pool to hire from. Um, so no, I think I think there is more yet to come. Um, I'll say that we've, we've seen quite significant growth here in the past few years, but I think reflecting my earlier comments that we're only at the, the, the sort of the initial takeoff stage of, of adding sustainable finance into people's skill sets, but also the roles and, and the, the dedicated roles here, um, more to come. But it's great to see people coming forth, whether from within the professional associations or whether within the universities, and already having some of that latent knowledge that they will need to apply to their role of being able to come in and then think about how they how they put that into practice. There's, there's no Can I come in there, Andrew? Just, just mention that issue of networks, such an important one, and it's important for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, that social capital that you develop when you're with a cohort of people. And this is why, you know, sadly, online training that we've had to do lately hasn't had as, uh, in my view, the same impact on the network. Perhaps you've got the content, but you haven't had those discussions, a cup of tea after, you know, or a beer after, a net, after an event where you can actually inspire each other, um, but also um, talk about the challenges. And Simon Connell will know there are challenges in this area because not everyone's going to agree with you. Or, or, or believe in what, what what you're trying to do, and so that network effect of education is really important. And I've got no doubt that's the same for um, Will and Simon Thompson's um, institutes, where you know people who go through those certificates find like-minded people. Mm. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly effect. always very happy to have a beer after an education and training session. So <laughs> I think that's something we think we maybe can maybe do. quite a lot of people would rather have the beer than the education. But <laughs> there's no danger that there is going to be an oversupply. Uh, there's no danger that this becomes fashionable and that everybody needs some sort of uh, environmental certificate tacked we, on. And it, it, we did some some research last year. Um, so CFA Institute um, looked at um, LinkedIn um, job positions and that we looked at a million investment professional roles. Apparently there are a million on LinkedIn or have been or something. And um, 6% of them um, look, had... had mentioned sustainability um, but uh, less than one percent of investment professionals at the time that we completed the research had something on sustainability in their cv and i suspect that both of those numbers have probably doubled at least in the last 12 months but it does give you an indication that supply that demand i think is still far outstripping supply and that's that's your view too jane i mean what well, i you... think i think this is what good good to as we're sort of coming to an end just to get this back to you know um what people are actually doing in their jobs um, so, you know, um, and I was surprised that such a that low count from, from the survey well. Um, so if you think about banks, I mean, I would have thought these days, and of course the Bank of England's stress testing with this, that at, you know, every every many loans now, there should be a sort of check, you know, is is there an environmental risk, you know, is there or some other sort of risk? And I would have thought that this was would have been sort of captured. Um, in in some of the risk assessments, and th an, a, a, an area that um, probably I know, but thinking about the investment chain, um, 
I think that what isn't new, but which is an important application is, you know, if an analyst is looking at a company um, and the company is claiming, you know, it's got it's got, going to be net zero by 2050, does that analyst have the tools to be able to, you know, actually say, well, yes, that's what you've said, but unless you do A, B and C, there's, you've got no chance of getting there. And we are seeing an increasing in, uh, amount of research and uh, sort of prodding, challenging in that area. But that's that's where you'd expect it on the ground. And at the other end, it's actually a newer area, is when the... Um, you know the intermediary the fund manager has to turn around to um say pension fund trustees who then have to tell their own beneficiaries in terms of communicating you know what they're doing um in terms of the investment portfolio and whether or not that does match up to what the end beneficiaries might think it's doing bearing in mind all the sort of warm words that are being said uh, about ESG so so i think that there's um actually one would i would have expected this to be affecting you know most jobs actually in some way or another not not every minute of every day but at some point so if i can can i just pull three things out of that jane because i think they're excellent comments the first is just the challenge that as we mainstream this but in the absence of a, a brand label or something equivalent to that it can be hard for people to show the skills and competencies they've got especially as they look to move between roles and between organizations um I think the second and extending that is there is a little bit of sort of caveat emptor or buyer beware in the market at the moment, because whilst there's more demand than supply, there's also variable qualities of supply. So I think not just for the network effect, but but also for the quality of the education, it's worth people thinking about you know, what are they actually getting and whether that's an institutional buyer buying at scale for a large population or whether it's an individual looking to um, acquire some some skill sets to support their development. And then I think to pick up on Sarah's point, because it then connects in the purpose piece, I, I don't think we can ignore that either at, again, an individual or an organizational level. Um, just because you've got the knowledge, uh, it's, I suppose the analogy that comes to mind here of, of you know, I, I've got some power tools downstairs, but I'm not sure I trust myself to use them. I, I would get a professional in. Um, there's a point at which it's sort of, you've got the knowledge, but actually, what are you going to use it in service of? Can I be a bit more insidious about the analogy there? Um, if you're a doctor and you've got the knowledge knowledge about anatomy, et cetera, you can use that for good or you can use that for evil. Um, and so I think we need to be aware of, you know, that as a, as a potential or a future or how people might be looking to use some of that knowledge. Well, I don't quite know where who who's using it for evil. Uh, perhaps we shouldn't go there. Can I thank, can I ask you as a final point where you see this uh, going over the next couple of years as we come out of the pandemic as the economies of the world go into hyperdrive i guess um as cop 26 approaches i mean i can see nothing to stop your industry growing and growing and growing and the importance of the professional bodies in this space growing and the and the importance of the uh, of the universities growing what are the obstacles that you might see can i ask you sarah first are there uh roadblocks that you that may well come up scale um people so um most most universities who have roles like this will find it difficult to get uh climate finance sustainable finance green finance experts employed into faculty partly because people like simon connell will keep them all in the private sector uh which is fine um but scale and getting people into the area um, other than that, um, the only roadblock I would see is um, commitment, actual commitment from corporates. And I don't say that um, in, a, in too negative a way. Corporates are going to have a very difficult road over the next three, four, five years. Uh, they have to survive. You know, we want companies to survive. That's important for our economy. Um, and they have to work out how, how to do that with a very difficult transition road and a very difficult economy. What are the obstacles that you foresee, Will? I, I mean, the, I think that the challenge, because I, I agree that I think this is an area where um, demand will continue to accelerate um, and um, also broaden out. So, you know, at the moment, there's a great deal of focus on climate, but I do expect that the impact will also become sort of an area of greater focus. And so the challenge, I think, is one of responding in, in a timely fashion. Um, and also adjusting the content of um, qualifications, you know, as the market changes and as policy and regulation um, is both added to and amended. So making sure that what the information that you're sharing and the skills that you're providing are, are current 
um, can be challenging. But I think professional bodies are fortunate because we can draw on the sort of the full um, universe of members who are, in many cases, skilled practitioners themselves and can pass that back through. We just have to be good at sort of being uh, good at, at, at an efficient interface between the skills that are already in the market and those that need them to be able to contribute to the market. Anything likely to hold you up, uh, Simon, Simon Thompson? Um, I think one of the greatest challenges, certainly in the UK, is that we've we've uh, willed the ends, but not the means uh, as yet, yeah. uh, as we sh as we should have done. Uh, and so, one thing in particular I'd like to see is to support green and sustainable finance and sustainability more broadly through the apprenticeship system, which of course is a is one of the main drivers of education and training spend, not just in financial services, but right across the economy at the moment. As I understand it, the Institute for Apprenticeships is considering establishing a green apprenticeships uh, panel of some sort, but we need to move much, much more quickly or we will fall behind other, uh, uh, particularly financial services hubs that are doing much more than, uh, than we are at a public policy level. Do you see any problems, um, Simon Connell, as coming up in terms of, you know, the universe is, 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 the world is your oyster if you're an environmental expert in the financial sector these days, is it not? Um, I think we, if we're optimistic, we look at the growth in and as we're ESG professionals. And if we're pessimistic, oh, because my camera's reversed, those look the other way around. Um, you, you, you can look at the extent to which the, girl, the world is actually meeting the sustainable development goals. And so I think, to my mind, the biggest blocker is mixing up the means and the end. Um, the, the means education as an enabler to a more sustainable society is great, um, but we need to actually be making progress against that. And so again, I, I, slightly inflammatory, but Sarah's comments on, on for evil, I think we've got to be careful. You know, people people aren't necessarily intentionally misusing their skills, but we've got to make sure that we're building uh, the workforce of the future who have the skills, know why and how they're going to use them, rather than just using the proxy of how many people are getting trained or how many people have ESG as a specialism on their LinkedIn profiles. Can I, can I redact the word evil and change it to not for good? <laughs> the final word is with you. What do you take away from this? Um, well, it's been a fruitful di discussion. We've ranged widely, but I think it's still um, it, it it's very it's still difficult to know how people will really implement this in their day to day jobs, especially when they're being pulled between the zeitgeist. Um, which is all very, you know, wanting things to be green and being very worried about um, uh, ESG effects um, and actually cold assessments of some of the difficult issues. On that uh, note, the use of the word zeitgeist, I think, brings us to the end of a, a, an interesting discussion on ESG and on the environment and environmental education. Can I thank uh, Simon Thompson from the Chartered Banker Institute, Will Goodhart from the CFA and Society of the UK, Sarah Ivory from the University of Edinburgh's Business School, and Simon Connell from Standard Chartered, and of course my colleague uh, Jane Fuller, and you for watching. Many thanks. <laughs>